Sorry, that's that's too entertaining. Um, I'm not bearing it back. I'm chatting, but I don't have a camera uh, because I I don't I don't I don't want to show you my my weird weird face because you'd get confused and then everyone would be like, what 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 is that? Why why does it have a segment for a head? Hello, my name is Laserpig, and today is my birthday. Congratulations, me. Um, it's not your birthday unless it is. Uh, then happy birthday to you. If not, uh, happy unbirthday. Cause that's a thing. <laughs> right. I apologize because I I'm got I do have other videos in the works. It's not just going to be this me shotting for two hundred hours. Um, but as we get closer to Christmas, I have what we call the big sad or seasonal depression. As, as many, many, many people try to say that it is, and working on videos right now is, is a bit of a, bit of a hit or miss for me. So I got about four videos in the works. Don't worry, I will be making more content. This is just a stopgap to stop the YouTube algorithm going, ah ha ha, I see you're dead. How dare you not upload once a week like I told you to to the end of the pile with you. Banishment to the sewers of YouTube. And I have to deal with that. Um, uh, down here in sewage tier YouTube and z zero viewer Twitch TV something something something. Hello, how are you? Excellent. Thank, thank God for that. Right. What we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be watching a historical documentary and bitching about how bad it is. Uh, I will be getting... I'm very drunk right now uh, we're doing this quite early in the morning because i don't want lots of people messaging me going oh my god happy birthday as as like people i have not seen in like 20 years suddenly messaging me and my phone will start pinging so if you hear lots of pings in the background um th like that that's what's going on <laughs> uh also there's a slight slight chance my mother will be watching this stream so we're going to try and keep the swear words to a minimum. I'm allowed three fucks, two cunts, and a dickhead. That's all I'm allowed. That's, that's, that's the rules that have been made up. I'm also very, very drunk, and I'm not going to apologize. It's my fucking birthday. And I will have some more beautiful, beautiful vodka. Oh, yes. Because I will be, um, I'll be taking a drink every time I have to correct a fact in this stupid documentary. Uh, you should not do that because we're not allowed to play drinking games on Twitch. I'll get banned from Twitch if they think I'm playing a drinking game. So, um, don't do that. I'll be drinking. You, you don't have to. Don't drink along. Don't do that. But if you want to drink along, I'm not going to stop you. Uh -huh. Right, let's get this fucking bullshit started. Hang on, it's not this one. That one. <laughs> That's kind of fun. I like doing that, you know. Okay, I'll stop now. Uh, this is um, German war themes. The Panther. You can hear this, right? Yeah, you can hear this. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, turn it, I'll turn it down slightly. Because it gets a bit loud. And I don't want... It, they make, oh, God, there's a bush coming towards you. Look at him. Oh, here he comes! <laughs> also, uh, if they play the song Erica, um, I'll, people will start. YouTube will think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an N word. The not that N word, the other N word. I'm not allowed to say that word anymore, because you live in a weird fucking. Um, you live. We live in a weird time when everyone's really, really sensitive. And you know, I I remember when I was younger. I used to I used to role play with a group of people on a game, role play servers on games. Yeah, I know. How, how tragic my life was back then. Uh, yeah, I remember it ran a roleplay coffee house, a fascist themed coffee house called uh, Gustafi. Um, yeah, we, we don't. It was it was fun. We had we had we had um, we had themed coffee and everything, um, and we used to scream at our customers. Um, yeah, I, I well, don't go into those kind of things. Anyway, here's some artillery. The origins of the pamphlet. Regarded as one of oh the God, finest media this guy? This guy's box war. Very, very quiet. He was turned back to examine the consequences for the German army, and in particular yes. the tank arm, of Hitler's momentous decision 
toward the Wehrmacht eastward against the Soviet Union. Yeah, this is the thing about all the these documentaries. They'll talk about June 22nd, 1941. Uh, they'll, they'll talk about Barbarossa. They'll talk about the East Coast to the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. Was lit up by the fire from a barrage of 6,000 like heavy guns, Norway, providing the overture to Operation like Barbarossa, the German assault on the Soviet Union, and the greatest land invasion in history. Is it the greatest land invasion in history? 3,350 tanks, yes. and supported by some 2,000 aircraft of the Luftwaffe, poured across the frontier, bent on employing the now well tested Blitzkrieg formula to defeat the USSR in a rapid campaign which Adolf Hitler expected to last no more than a few months. He's going to say something here. He's going to quote Hitler at some point. I know, I know he's going to say this quote, because they all fucking say it. Wait for it. Wait for it. The dictator of Nazi Germany viewed the Soviet Union with derision, claiming its image as a powerful modern state was a sham. He said, we have only to kick in the front door and the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. There it is. The whole kick in the front door, the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. Now, there's been some debate if Hitler actually said that or not, or if that was a quote from one of his generals, because um, his generals believed, um, because the way, the way things happened in France, and the idea that the way wars happened back then, was once you took the capital of a country, that country was defeated. And that worked in France, where they took Paris, and the rest of France capitulated almost immediately, even though the entire southern region of France which still had a pretty substantial army, um, just, just surrendered immediately. It was completely unoccupied. Uh, it became Vichy France. You know, they sided with the Nazis, the, the traitorous assholes. Um, but yeah, they generally believed, they generally believed that, that, that once they took Moscow, that Moscow was the, the, the primary target. Once they took Moscow, all of Russia would capitulate. And that was never going to happen. <laughs> Because that's the same mistake Napoleon made. <laughs> yeah, Russians don't care if you take Moscow or not, because they'll take it back. Uh, Such delusion, while grounded in the first instance well, yeah, on his anti-Semitic, anti-Marxist and the racist This documentary is not too bad. It's not the worst Which reduced the Slavs that's, that's, that's that's ever been. to the level of mere subhumans in the Nazi worldview was People also heavily coloured by a German intelligence analysis of Soviet military and economic power that was profoundly flawed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was flawed. Let's start talking about uh, German military intelligence at this point. German military intelligence is fucking awful. It's a front cap. Tanks. Those are Panzer This tanks. analysis, which underlay German planning for Barbarossa... That's not, that's not, right there, right, you can see my mouth, right here. That is a 35R. That is a Czechoslovakian tank. That's an incredibly rare Czechoslovakian tank with the, the weird uh, spring suspension there. You don't see a lot of those. Uh, they're tiny, but um, Rommel used to quite like these things. It was remarkable more for what it did not oh, there's know another, about there's the another than what it did. Interesting. Thus, numbers of aircraft and tanks in Soviet service were not known. Figures proffered being mere guesses. Little was known of the Soviet order of battle or of the detailed organization of Soviet military formations. Nor had the Germans any inkling of the profound changes wrought on Soviet industry by the five year plans and thus of the potential of the USSR to fight a prolonged war. In short, the German armed forces had plunged into war with the Soviet Union, sustained only by the unsubstantiated conviction that the Red Army was not fit to engage in a modern conflict and would be unable to defend itself against the most modern and effective war machine in existence. Okay, so, I take, I, I take, okay, all of that is true. The, the Germans genuinely believed that um, the Soviet Union were like full of backwards people, that, um, they didn't really know what the hell they were doing, etc., 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 but... They're racists. You know, racists are racists. What, what, do, you, what do you expect? What I take... Um, what I take uh, uh, offense here is that they claim that, um, and this this is the perpetual belief that that Nazi Germany was was is, the, is is still the most modern and efficient way of doing things in a military way, and and that our leaders, military leaders now, are still using the same tech. There's not. There's not. Um, 
the, the tactic Blitzkrieg is actually, um, it's it's not called Blitzkrieg. They continuously refer to it as Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is something completely different. It just means lightning war. And when they say lightning war, they mean, um, this is basically Germans, Germany's generals saying, okay, we don't have enough resources or enough manpower to go on a prolonged, sustained campaign. Everything's got to be done very, 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 very quickly. You know, we, we can't we can't go back to World War One. We can't be digging trenches and defenses and and having huge campaigns that last for years and years and years because we'll lose because we just don't have the resources. Therefore, everything needs to be done fast. This needs to be a lightning war, a blitzkrieg. That's what that means. The actual tactic people keep talking about blitzkrieg is is not blitzkrieg. That is called combined arms. And that was invented in the First World War. Because most people look at the First World War and they think, ah, trenches. Everyone just sat in trenches, firing artillery at each other. No, there was mobile warfare. It started as mobile warfare. The first year of the First World War was mobile warfare. And it didn't work because machine guns. Everyone started building trenches. And then combined arms come along, which is the idea of using tanks and artillery and aircraft and infantry all at, all at the same time, all working with each other uh, as opposed to independently. And um, and honestly, I think the most modern and equipped and most powerful force in the world right now is probably the USA. Uh, probably. I mean, I'm pretty sure Russia would, would take uh, would take offense to that, but, you know, they have their chance. At least T-34 with Mickey Mouse ears. Shit, I'm not allowed to say that. That's yet, got all that happened in the opening months of the campaign seemed to substantiate German beliefs about the state of the Red Army and yes. the nature of the Soviet state. Yes. Unbeknown to the Germans, however, they had chosen to attack at the worst possible moment for the Soviet Union. Which they hadn't, they hadn't. They'd also had, they were also having alliance. They had an alliance with, with the Russians and the Russians were not expecting a back, well, they kind of were expecting the Germans to backstab them at some point, but they thought they had a, a little bit more time. You know, they, well, they, they're like, okay, they will backstab us, but eh, maybe not for another couple of years. So, uh, they were kind of still transitioning. Also, the whole also another problem with with Russia um, was Russia had all the men and equipment and everything. That that whole scene about the the um, an enemy at the gates. Um, you may have you may have seen it with like um, you know one man pick has the rifle. If the guy with the rifle dies, the second man picks up the rifle and continues to charge. Um, <laughs> Everyone has three bullets, but every five men have one rifle. Um, so that idea, Russia had enough equipment to feed its entire army and to give it all equipment and to give it everything that it had. Um, but that wasn't the... So people look at the statistics. People look at like tales of that where like, where, like Russian soldiers were like hard cardboard boxes instead of on their feet instead of shoes and were looting boots off the Germans and stuff. They didn't all have guns. They didn't all have bullets. Some of them had potatoes instead of grenades. Um, yeah, and then, other, and then another bunch of people come and say, well, that wasn't true because if you look at, at their production history, they produced way more guns than they ever needed. And that's true. What actually happened was the entire um, logistics, the entire logistics force of Russia just completely collapsed overnight because they suddenly had to ship all these troops over to the west from wherever the hell they were. And the person who was in charge of logistics, like moving military equipment and food and everything else around, was second to people like Zukov. So Zukov would say, I need this train to, to transport men, and so take everything off the train. <laughs> And put men on it, so the men would get there, and then the next train full of men would get there, the next train full of men. So the men were arriving at the front, but their equipment wasn't, because their equipment was, was kind of like stuck in ports or, or stuck in train stations waiting for Zukov to finally say, okay, you can have this train, logistics man. I forget his name, he's, he's very handsome. The Red Army was not only attempting to uh, recover from the impact of the devastating effect I'm of the purges now, that had decimated the Soviet officer corps, yes. but also from the shame of its performance in the winter war against Finland. Yeah, but in June 1941, it was also one the of massive internal change, including a territory. huge re-equipment program. There's also talk that um, Seamill, the White Death, the sniper, 
in Finland and apparently killed like hundreds of Russian soldiers by himself. Maybe be real. I, I don't know how true that is. Oh shit, nice shot. I don't really know how true that is, but apparently it's, it's, it's a bit exaggerated. These things typically tend to be a bit exaggerated. I keep moving my mouse and then this Although thing the German happens. panzer columns tore through the Soviet defences, driving deep into the farmer. hinterland... That, that German guy's just a farmer, look at him. ...tore through the Soviet defences, driving deep into the hinterland oh, and encircling that? hundreds of thousands of Russian troops in massive pockets Aww. within weeks of the opening of the campaign, there were more than a few indications that led many Germans to realise that this new war in the East would be quite unlike that fought the summer before. One yeah, officer in the 18th Russia's Panzer Division wrote, France. There was no feeling, as there had been in France, of entry into a defeated nation. Yeah. Instead, there was resistance. Always resistance, however hopeless. But that, that, that's, another, that's another interesting point right there. Um, see, how can I put this kindly? So, Russia, I mean, I'm, France felt defeated immediately. Uh, their, their leaders were fucking terrible i mean absolutely fucking terrible and they just um the german army never actually fought the french army they fought like, limited pockets of resistance um c-class troops that were like had like basic level equipment but all the best french soldiers were on this were on the uh the secret line or the oh god what's the french call it, it wasn't the secret line god that oh no that's gonna let me i've forgotten i've forgotten shut up phone Hang on a second. Hang on a second. This is incredibly professional. Professional, um, YouTubing. Sorry, twitching. Whatever the hell I'm doing. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Imagine a line. Fucking hell. Ugh. How can I, 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 okay. So all the best. <laughs> He's not a historian. He forgot about the Maginot Line. He called it the Siegfried Line. That was... That was uh, yeah, that, yeah, that was what happened when... Um, that was the German defences on the other side. Or just when they captured the French defences and turned them around. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Um, no, all the best French soldiers were on, were on the Maginot Line. And these really cool defenses, like they had like little trains that went under them and little tunnels and everything. And they could ship ammo and, and, and troops around this and huge, huge defensive network. Really interesting stuff. Um, and, and yeah, all the best French troops were there. And the other best French troops were surrounded, surrounding Paris and, and, and that kind of area and the kind of southern region into Lorraine and stuff. And they were told, like, um, they were told to surrender. They were told to put down your arms, burn your tanks, and run. And that's what they did. So as the Germans advanced through France towards Paris, um, they're just coming across just like heaps of, of just burnt equipment and, and just trash lying everywhere. And, and, and they never really fought the French army um, on the scale that they should have. Whereas in Russia, they kind of did. <laughs> And they start taking heavy losses, like like right off the bat. Plus, the fact you have the, the fact that the, because of the huge territory expanse of Russia in comparison to France, that uh, uh, German Hitler decided to take all his all his uh, Panzer units, double them in number, but reduce the number of tanks that each of them had by half to accommodate the, the greater divisions. So these these tank divisions are now at half strength than they were previously. And they've got lots more area to try and cover, and they've got lots more objectives to do, uh, a lot more rivers to cross, little towns where there's like little local resistance. Uh, yeah, so they start taking huge, huge amounts of losses. Germany did have better tanks at the time, but they were sitting in reserve, waiting for the Hitler Youth to grow up. And I'm not making this up. He was just waiting for like his his perfect doctrinated soldiers. To, to grow up, become 18, and then get into the army themselves, and they'd have the better tanks that were sitting in the shed. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep going. Indeed, even Hitler sensed as much, telling Mussolini that Soviet soldiers fought with truly stupid fanaticism, with the primitive brutality of an animal that sees itself trapped. Oh, Hitler. Well, the Fuhrer, no doubt. 
he's saw such as confirmed I mean, he the evidence Hitler, so, you know. of the subhuman nature of the Russians, even he could not have missed that these same subhumans had already killed over 100,000 German troops in the opening weeks of Barbarossa, more than in all the previous campaigns combined. I love the, the added effects of putting it in the background of uh, a tank engine. I know, I know where that, I know where that sound comes from. It's, it's from a, it's from a German propaganda video. You show it in this documentary somewhere. I point it out to you. Nor were the Germans oblivious to the seemingly endless numbers of Soviet divisions that made their appearance on the battlefield. Only to be fed into the German mincing machine. I think he's going to give some then numbers. Then replaced so by more. That's a drink. By the end of July, the Germans had already identified more Soviet divisions than the wrong. estimated the Red Army possessed. So the Soviets is... were profligate with their manpower, but in the face of the rapidity of the German advance and their unpreparedness to cope with Blitzkrieg, they had to trade lives and space. Yes, I've watched the documentary before. If you did. Thousands and thousands, then hundreds of thousands of prisoners were taken. One German soldier later recalled, the earth brown crocodile slowly shuffled down the road towards us. Prisoners of war, Russians, six deep. We couldn't see the end of the column. As they drew near, the terrible stench which met us made us feel quite sick. We made haste out of the way of the foul cloud which surrounded them. Then what we saw transfixed us where we stood and we forgot our nausea. Were these really human beings, those gray brown figures, those shadows lurching towards us, stumbling and staggering, moving shapes at their last gasp, creatures which only some flicker of the will to live enabled them to obey the order to march. Very poetic that, isn't it? I can't find that poem anywhere, but I'd love to know who actually wrote it, because it sounds like propaganda. <laughs> it sounds like it's been written in an office somewhere. And like a propaganda minister is like, I just signed your name there and we'll print it in the paper. On July the 16th, less than a month after the beginning of Barbarossa, the city of Smolensk, you know, it was no idea how, how crazy the German fell propaganda to the unit of Generals was. Hoth and they, had a team, they had a small team of uh, destroyed eastward, Allied tanks. German and armor had brushed them. aside or destroyed so large if, numbers like, of Soviet um, tanks. The, 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 the team had, had not destroyed, destroyed the enough the Allied tanks at this point. But the Red Army possessed a tank park of about 10,000 machines. And this was the benchmark accepted by the army. However, it was becoming all too clear that this figure was much too small, and that the real figure was in excess of some 20,000 tanks. Nope. Hitler later stated to Guderian Incorrect. that had he known Russian tank. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that what he's saying there. I was talking over it, so I apologize. Um, what he was talking there is the German intelligence believed the Russians only had a few thousand tanks. They put that figure at 8,000 potentially. Mostly old tanks, like uh, a lot of early, a lot of early Russian tanks were British export export tanks, uh, especially ones like the T twenty six range and stuff. Of like the Mick, I think, what is that? The Mick Vickers Mark three or something? I can't remember. Anyway, you can look it up. It's fine. Anyway, so and uh, the BT series, which is just the American Christie tank. Uh, and the T thirty. I'll talk about the T thirty five later, actually. But um. Yeah, it's, 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 they thought 8,000 tanks. Um, he says 20,000 tanks. It was actually closer to 40,000 tanks. <laughs> they, they had a lot. They had, an, they had an absolute lot. And keep in mind, Germany, when it's invading, 3,500 tanks. The strength to have been as large. Just giving you a He would have seriously a, reconsidered his decision to invade Russia. But just how fucked they were at this point. Numbers, though, did not equal quality. By far and away, the bulk of Soviet armor was obsolete. Most of the designs dated back to the early 30s, drawing heavily on foreign designs. What the newsreels show the most of are wrecked and burning T-26s, T-28s, T-37s, and light tanks of the BT series. None mounted a gun larger than 45 millimeters, and all had thin armor. The short-barreled 50 millimeter gun of the Panzer Mark III and the short 75 millimeter gun of the Panzer IV had no difficulty destroying these tanks, and the footage herein shows large numbers of these tanks destroyed and on fire. Even the 20mm cannon of the Panzer II light tank and the 37mm gun on the Panzer 38T had no difficulty taking out these light Soviet designs. Even the large there and impressive is. T-35... That is a T-35. That, that, now that is one particular T-35 because that one's not been destroyed, it's been abandoned. Um, 
And that's very important because this particular T-35 you're seeing here, uh, there's, there's, there's a big thing in the 1920s about multi-turreted tanks. I fucking love multi-turreted tanks. The 1920 came up with some crazy tank designs. But um, let me find you a picture if YouTube will allow... No, no, I keep saying YouTube because I'm a fucking moron. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay, so yeah, War Thunder did a thing where the there it is. I think. Yes, there you go. Okay. <laughs> You should be seeing it now. So that's uh, the Vickers uh, A1E1 Independent. That was an actual tank they built. It's still around. It's in Bovington Tank Museum. You can go see it. And so that is like one of the first like proper multi-turreted tanks in the 1920s. And they built these big things. I was like, because you know, back back in the 1920s, like after the First World War, they're like, hmm, what 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 do tanks do on a battlefield? What 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 should their purpose be on a battlefield? Should they follow the troops around? Should they shell the uh, Enemy from afar, should they? Yeah, this is my this is my British general uh, impersonation voice, by the way. And should should they? Um, and someone came on with the idea of I've got a great idea. How about they do everything? And so they built this ridiculous thing. It's got a ladder on the side and everything. Holy shit! Uh, they built this ridiculous thing that could do technically anything it that they need that thing to do. Uh, without modification. <sighs> Excuse me. Now, apparently, and this is where things get spicy. My creaky chair, by the way. Please, please, please sponsor me, chair companies. This creaky chair is really annoying. Um, <laughs> I cannot afford a gamer chair. Uh, also, I look like a sandwich uh, in a cardigan, and I think I'd look very, very strange on a like a proper gamer chair with like ninja or something written on the back I don't, I don't fucking i don't know the name of any other popular streamers young people tell me what who is popular what what's who is popular in the twitch stream i, I don't i don't fucking know anyway more drink uh ninja's a ninja's a streamer isn't he yeah the blue haired guy yeah I, I know him i know okay i know who he is there i've 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 said a modern reference no, I'm cool. And anyway, yes, no. Uh, so supposedly, um, the plans for this tank, the A1 Independent, a lot of um, British people at the time, especially ones in government, were going, well, the tank is too expensive. They'll never be on a battlefield. They'll never be used again. Uh, and one particular, one particular chappy chappy um, decided that uh, that was not the case. And was like, these you're all fools and, and communism is the best. And so he apparently defected to communist Russia, taking with him the plans for the independent A1E1, which were developed into the T-35. Now, there has been a lot of controversy over this, which I will not get into. <laughs> a lot of spicy, spicy tea in the history community. I was like, oh, is that true or not? I don't really, I don't know. Uh, it might be, it might not be. Uh, the Russians claim the T-35 was, was, was independently created and those plans were never used. Uh, British people say otherwise because the, 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 um, the influence of the design is clearly there. But you can, you, you can, you can do what you want with that information. I, I don't really care. Anyway, back to, back to this bullshit. So this particular T-35 uh, was captured, it wasn't destroyed. And this very interesting mode it was um used in combat again by the germans in 1945 in the defense of berlin when they had uh, they basically it was taken back as a war trophy and placed in a small museum there outside the reichstag with a number of other uh tanks including my absolute favorite the french uh sharpie one a sharp uh, one a sharp two c which you've not uh fuck it, i'm looking up another picture of a tank now <laughs> Oh, you know what the Char 2C looks like. I've got one on my desk. It's beautiful. 
Yes, no, you will not see my fucking... Fucking, it's like, hey, can, can we see cookies? Can we... Okay, that's it there. That's what it looks like. Uh, it's huge. Musket tags. So it's one of those that's at the rich tag, but also a T-35. And these were used in defense of Berlin and was shot at by the Russians and presumably destroyed. But anyway, let's, 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 let's keep talking. The multi turreted tank seen here was highly vulnerable to German fire. But amid this welter of obsolescence, there were a number of new designs that sent shockwaves through the Panzerwaffe. In the KV-1 and KV-2, the Soviets had two machines technologically superior to any German tank. Also known as Stalin's fridge, for reasons. That's a huge turret there. Jesus Christ. I, I gotta take... I'm taking a drink here because, you know, I, I always have to point out to people exactly when... what exactly when just just putting thicker armor on a tank count as advanced technology kv2 the soviets had two machines technologically superior to any german tank i mean i mean if, if, if i wear a shirt that that's thicker than the your British shirt Matilda, i might more technologically advanced heavy armament as well in the case of the kv1 a 76 millimeter gun and on the kv2 152 millimeter howitzer these were truly formidable machines it's shells from german tanks out. bounced off the armor of these monsters but it was the T-34 that made the greatest impression. Here we go. Fast, weighing some 26 tons, with well-sloped heavy armor, and carrying a 76 millimeter gun, it came as a revelation to the German tankers. Look okay, okay, okay. This tank here. Can we discuss this tank for a little bit? <laughs> People are probably going mad at me, like, like, please stop pausing the video, just let it play, I don't want to hear you talk. Um, this tank, we have a bit of a problem with this tank because I, I, in a video that I haven't produced yet, I will be talking about something called the Panther Paradox, which is partially why I'm watching a, 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 a short mock documentary about um, the development of the Panther. Uh, I'm going to put this delicately. There are soft factors and hard factors in tank design. Hard factors being uh, firepower, speed and armor and soft factors being how quickly can you repair it what are the sites like how quickly can you open the hatches how quickly can you reload it uh how good is it on terrain so on and so forth the t-34 is another one of these good hard factors bad soft factor designs and a lot of people absolutely love this tank and will defend it to death and if you say anything anything against it they will they will bring the fire of hell against you it's 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 like trying to push yourself upstream. It's like well, I don't think the T thirty I don't think the T thirty four is any good. How dare you, heretic! Burn the witch. It's basically what they're like. Um, I, I have a long standing feud with a guy called uh, TanksArchive.com who has a fucking boner for the T-34, thinks it's the best tank of the war, thinks it's the best tank ever, uh, has visited an archive, so he, you know he's telling the truth and he's an actual historian, unlike us plebs. I've been to a fucking archive, show your face. It was only available in small numbers and poorly employed. Yeah, the T-34 being these, examined these, here the early T is the earliest model coming off had, the production um, line in 1940. High explosive rounds for some reason. As in France, when dealing with the heavily armoured British and French tanks, the 88mm flat gun was found to be able to deal with the new Soviet tank designs. That's all you get by the idiot, by the way. German infantry found I, other methods for destroying. Again, again, the fucking flak 88 is like seen as this mythical war winning weapon by, by many, many people who. I genuinely, genuinely seem surprised that we're still not using that stupid gun. Um, the, the, the thing about the 88, the Flak 88, is it's, it's not because that gun was good. It's because German anti-tank guns were fucking awful. They were terrible. They couldn't do anything. They were the worst in the world at, some, at this point. They were absolutely awful. Um, 
where it's the vast majority of the tanks that they were facing. Of course, they never really fought the French um, tank to tank that much. Every time they did, they would lose uh, on a tank on tank warfare with the French. They would either lose or they would be forced to try and run around the French tanks really, really, really quickly until the French tanks um, basically burned out all their fuel or they couldn't see them because they had these stupid one man turrets. Um, against the British, against uh, the cruiser tanks, they could penetrate the cruiser tanks because they were very, very lightly armed. The heavier tanks, the Matilda 1s and 2s, <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't even scratch. Uh, so Rommel almost died to a Matilda 2. Uh, so the Matilda 2s would just drive over the guns because they couldn't they can do anything. And so he took command of a Flak 88 uh, battery, ordered them to fire the British tanks. And then, in his report, described an invincible armada of hundreds of Allied tanks, immune to everything we could throw at them. And that is what caused the Great Halt order. Right down the German command tree was, was Rommel just absolutely shitting himself. <laughs> so if anyone ever tells you it, it was Hitler being merciful and allowing the Allies to escape, they're lying. Now you know the truth. Drawing T-34s and KVs. Uh, but yeah, those, those tanks Satchel were very charges rare, were placed on the Soviet machine. And although this uh, required great nerve, as a soldier had to run up to the tank in order to deposit the about charge Russia on the enemy deck or wedge it below the turret a, overhead. A regular tank that's Such immune to were quite often the only the German anti-tank weapons. The 37mm <laughs> the, 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 the gun is the only thing that can penetrate this. And the ADA is a big, slow, cumbersome thing that takes a while to aim, takes a while to set up, needs a specialised crew. Uh, it was only with the launch of Operation Typhoon, it's very, very bad when the German have, offensive um, to capture Moscow. It's very, very bad when you have... A, he's, he's about to say something about Guderian, and I, 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 I've got a fucking rant about Guderian. Uh, I'm only 11 minutes into this, Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to shut up and let the documentary play at some point. But um, what was I saying? No, the AD is actually, it's a, it's a terrible gun as an anti-tank gun, because it's cumbersome, it's slow, and needs a specialised crew, it needs different sights. And it's only effective because the other German um, anti-tank guns are, are fucking terrible and can't do anything, can't fucking destroy anything. So, <laughs> so everyone's like, oh, the 88's amazing, it could destroy any tank in the battlefield. It's like, well, every other faction also had similar guns to the 88. They just didn't need to use them because they had better anti-tank guns. You fucking muppet, shut up. In late September 1941, but the T-34 became a real threat to the Panzers. With the onset of the Rasputitsa, a period of rain before the start of winter, and which turned Russian roads into quagmires, the German Panzers sank up to their axles because of their narrow tracks, whereas the T-34 coped with the conditions because theirs were much broader. At Midsensk on the 4th of October, T-34s operated in large numbers for the first time, inflicting heavy casualties on the Panzer 3s of the large okay, number. Wait, 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 wait. Huh. I was looking at this tank here, I was like, that's. Is that, no, that's a. That's a. It's on the 4th of October. T 34s operated in large numbers the first time, inflicting heavy casualties on the Just Panzer the 3s huh. of the 4th Panzer Division. Guderian was later to comment that it was at the Battle of Mitzensk that for the first time the vast superiority of the T 34 became plainly apparent to the Germans. Okay. Guderian. We need to talk about Guderian. I'm, I apologize again. I'm going off in a pre-ramble. Um, we, we need we need to talk about fucking Guderian. Um, so, imagine you're a, a World War II German commander. You lose the war. You come out the other end. There's a big trial where they're trialing all these Nazi war criminals. But you've never committed a war crime. No one can prove you've committed a war crime. So you get away scot-free. So... Excuse me. You obviously you sit, so you, you now have to take care of your future. You now have to take your care of your of your own career. What are you going to do with your life? And um, well, the army is all you know. So you want to stay in the army, and um, so you go around and you say, well, all the, all the war crimes, all the crap. It was all it was all the it was all the Nazis. It was all their fault. Uh, they're the ones that that fucked everything up. Uh, it was I wanted to do it my way. You know, so, so Guderian writes, um, so the, the war memorial, the war documentary, and the war diary becomes very, very popular after the Second World War for all these surviving German generals trying to prove that 
they 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 knew what they were doing. It was all Hitler's fault. Like he was he was the 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 mastermind behind everything that that, that kept getting everything wrong and kept fucking everything up because they wanted jobs in NATO. <laughs> when West when West Germany became West Germany and the sort of Soviet bloc started to form, they wanted jobs in NATO, and that's exactly what Guderian got. He wrote this huge memoir where he basically takes credit for inventing tank warfare. And then he becomes uh, he becomes an advisor for NATO because he tells them, Oh, I fought the Russians. I know how to defeat them. Give me money. And NATO does that. <laughs> because they're expecting to go to war with Russia. So if you give Guderian any amount of money, he will say whatever you fucking want. Um, so because his diary and his version of events was taken as gospel and accepted that that was all true until early 2000s when something very interesting happened and that is uh british intelligence mi5 uh, declassified a lot of documents from bletchley park and what was happening at bletchley park apart from the uh the coding office that was uh, decrypting all the, the german coders there was a huge mansion there that was being run by a, a, a man who, who was the brother of the king. You know, I'm, I'm the brother of the king. You know, this is a very good friend of mine. You know, and um, what they did was they got all these German officers that they'd captured, were capturing throughout the war, any of any rank, and they were all putting them all together in this mansion, and they were given their own rooms. They were given fresh water, uh, showers, and baths, and good food, and taken on trips to Mayfair and London and everything. And treated like fucking royalty. And what they didn't know is firstly that brother of the king was actually a secret agent in disguise. And, every, and the entire building was bugged. Everything they said was being taped and recorded and then listened to and translated. And so all their conversations <laughs> are kept on record. And it was only when we got access to these records and started walking through it, you realised just how much of a fucking bitch fest German High Command actually was, and how much, I'm going to use it now, I'm going to use the word, how much of a cunt Guderian actually was. <laughs> how much of a lying cunt he was. I'm sorry, mother, I've said it twice. Uh, yeah, he just, he just made shit up left, right and centre. He was not a good general. And everyone knew he was not a good general, but he, he liked to take the credit for everything. And... Um, his underlings were well aware of this, but that was how you got advancement in the German army. Uh, you politically embarrassed your rivals, took credits for everything good, shoved everything bad, and then you advanced through political favour. It was um, it, it, the German high command was a Game of Thrones, basically. There's there's tales of, of like entire German div infantry divisions um, being killed and being sacrificed, um, basically. Um, to help save this one general's career because he's like well i could t i could share this intelligence and tell them that they're about to get overrun and tell them to retreat but they're commanded by general so-and-so and if he loses that oh he'll have nothing left and then i'll get promoted and it's like that's that's how they that, that that's how they operate it it's, it's really interesting um some wrote a book all about it and if you get the chance to look it up and read it, then absolutely do it because I can't remember anything. When Typhoon finally anything. ground to an exhausted halt at the beginning of December, <laughs> large it's, numbers it's of T-34s belonging document. to the fresh divisions I'm and trained well, from Siberia I? led the Soviet <laughs> counteroffensive in front of Moscow on December the 5th, 1941. By then it had become apparent to the German army that it had to take steps to address the clear technological superiority and tank design possessed by the Soviets and represented in the T-34. In fairness, every tank they were coming across was superior to them. Pretty much any tank that was built uh, in the late 30s was superior to their own. German tanks, especially the early German tanks, were fucking awful. Ooh. Hang on a minute. Yeah. That's a... Uh... <laughs> Doing a whole sort of Tokyo drift there. That's that's a uh, Jagd Panzer, I think. Could be a Stug, but it's got this kind of slippy bit at the back, so I think it's a Jagd Panzer. Very rare tax things. Very rare. In October, a Panzer Commission led with General Heinz Guderian at Orel in there Russia to consider ways of responding Guderian. to the T-34. Look it up. In addition to continuing developing God, he looks the heavy like the target mummy, tank, 
The decision was taken to proceed with production oh, of a new medium is. pulsar the big boy. under the designation of VK-3002. And then there's Contracts this. for this which were issued walk. within days of the return to Germany. Supposedly, the initially favoured design from Daimler Benz clearly reflected the influence of the T-34, with heavily sloping armour and turret mounted far forward on the hull. On May the 15th, 1942, Hitler acceded to the recommendations of a report that favoured production of the alternative design submission from the Mann Company. The prototype yes. Mann... Basically, um, so they make their own version of the T-34 uh, using basically cobbled together spare parts that they had lying around. Um, and uh, then they decide that actually they don't want to do that. They want to build a much heavier tank and so they built the Panther, which had already been in production as a replacement to the Tiger anyway, and didn't have anything to do with the T-34 at all. Man Panther incorporated so the many changes mm -mm. foisted on the design team in the course of the new Panther's development. Oh no, I'm Weight had grown to 45 tons, and the tank oh. now mounted the longer and more formidable 75mm L-70 gun. Contracts were issued in September 1942 for 1,000 Panthers, with the first leaving the Man Works in January 1943. The Man Works. Parallel production lines were set up with Daimler Benz, MNH, and are seen in this still at Henschloch Castle. It was at the latter concern that a very brief glimpse of one of the new Panther medium tanks, seen just beyond the target in the foreground, was captured on newsreel in May 1943. That be red. The new Panther had a very short gestation they, they period, paint, they had them, from they drawing board to production red, line in just over factory. a year. Like sort of rust -proof thing. There was much optimism that this new tank would provide the Panzerwaffe with the technical edge on the Eastern Front it had hitherto lacked. The first model of the Panther was the Type D, identifiable by its drum type commander's cupola with lid hatch and machine gun flap on the left side of the glacis. In other respects, such as armour thickness, it was to remain the same on all preceding models. 80mm for the frontal plate, 120mm for the gun mantlet, and 40mm on the sides. That's a drink. He'll say, this, he'll say um, the side armour again and, um, at some point earlier on. He'll get it wrong again. It was actually 30mm on the side. That, that is disgustingly thin. 30mm, yeah, like, like early, early British tanks. Hang on, let me show you one. Uh, oh god, that's a model. Yeah. It's so cute, though. It's so cute. Oh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Uh, look at it. Look how cute that is. Oh, it's so tiny and adorable. I love it. <laughs> Uh, that's a that's an early British cruiser tank. I think that's actually Coventer, maybe. I'm not sure. No, it's a, it's a cruiser Mark IV. Okay, um, it says it right at the top of the goddamn screen. Um, that's uh, yeah, that's got a two pounder gun that can crack through thirty millimeters of armor. So like even like really stupid early tanks that were all terrible, um, that the Panther is 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 vulnerable to them. It's 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 a. Mm. Yeah, thirty millimeter side armor, bad choice. But they made it. They made it so huge, and oh god. But they were kind of. I think they were kind of hoping that like the, the early model A mounted them, a new uh, turret with a cast cupola the thing is, you, with seven pairs of right wheels. The later A saw the introduction of the machine gun ball mount and the glacis. Tank explodes. Introduced in March 1944 was the G which was to remain in production until war's end. The G is the one that... Uh, the combat debut of the Panther the one during Operation uh, Citadel fixed the in problems. July 1943 was decidedly it inauspicious. Didn't. This last German offensive in the East was meant to be a limited affair, fought over a very restricted geographical area and rapidly concluded. But in terms of the actual number of tanks and forces allocated, it was a major commitment of scarce resources at a time when the scope of the war was widening dramatically. In part, um, it was to address this quandary that Citadel was launched. Cool. The task of the offensive was to destroy the great Soviet salient at Kursk and eliminate the vast Soviet forces therein, thus shortening the front line and freeing up Panzer divisions for transfer to the west to deal with the expected Allied landings on the mainland of Europe. Originally planned for the spring, Citadel was repeatedly delayed to allow for adequate numbers of Ferdinand assault guns and Tiger and Panther tanks to be assembled. 
For Hitler believed that only with their presence in sizable numbers could a favorable outcome for the battle be assured. You can start to see um, Hitler's slow receding no footage Belief exists in, of the approximately um, 200 Panthers committed to the offensive. Well, so, and, and combined arms organized into and tank battalions 51 and 52, and under the command like of Major von Lauchert, the Panther Regiment was subordinated to the Gross Deutschland Division during Citadel. On paper, the Panther Regiment represented the most powerful armored unit at Kursk, yeah. but its effectiveness was to be severely inhibited by its premature commitment to battle. I actually quite like how he, he he makes the he makes the difference there that like on paper it, the, the the Panther and uh, the Panther armor divisions look look as impressive as hell, but in reality they're they're fucking shit. Although raised at the beginning of 1943, the two battalions suffered so many problems with their Panthers that most of them were returned to the factories for overhaul or rebuilding. Guderian, now Inspector General of Armored Troops, called the Panther our problem child, for it was it's, a maintenance um... nightmare. The inevitable fruit of a very a hasty development the and production and schedule. They just couldn't handle the weight of the tank. Even the crews did not receive the time to fully train on their new charges. With, uh, sorry, I'm pausing it again. I do apologize. So part of this is to do with um, there's a secret war going on in the background. So I'm going to assume you're not stupid. You know what tungsten is. So tungsten, very, very durable, very, very solid metal. You need it for a lot of specialist equipment. Now, a lot of tungsten comes from Spain and Turkey and several other countries and britain is buying it all doesn't need it britain has a lot of its own tungsten but it is literally just buying all the tungsten it can at hugely inflated prices um that germany cannot afford and it, because of this because they don't have so much tungsten when you get to designs like the pan like the, the panther they they knew how to build a tank that was heavy and had a good suspension but they had to go back to an older style suspension that couldn't handle the weight because they didn't have the tungsten to build it <laughs> so yeah the panther's suspension and drivetrain and everything is really outdated and it's really bad and that is what is causing the panther to continuously break down and because they are trying to push out as many panthers as possible they're not building spare parts they're just building new Panthers. So every time a Panther breaks down, it has to go back to the factory to be repaired because they don't have spare parts. Unless there's another Panther nearby that they can cannibalize. But because of the same spare parts, the ones that are breaking. <laughs> if you find another broken down if you find another broken down Panther, it's mostly like that part that you need is the what the thing that's broken. So uh, Five days into the offensive, there were only ten Panthers operational. Ten Panthers. Although just twenty five had been destroyed, a hundred had broken down. <laughs> While the frontal armour had proven effective, the 40mm side armour was shown to be vulnerable to Soviet anti-tank fire, many Panthers being lost in this fashion. Yep. Nevertheless, the 75mm gun was shown to be highly effective, terrible. destroying T-34s at 3,000 metres. As the production tempo increased, more Panther battalions were being raised and hastily deployed to combat the growing power of the Red Army, the Panther, which having wrested the military the initiative at Kursk, was in the months after the battle, pushing the Germans back all along the southern part of the front. By October, there were five army I mean, and SS battalions in action in Russia, admit, the with others coming on stream tank. in November. The furious pace of operations <laughs> and oh, continuing all, technical all problems <laughs> led to high losses. <laughs> of the total of 841 Panthers deployed to the Eastern Front in 1943, only 80 out of an available 217 were actually operational on December the 31st, some 624 machines having been lost in combat since July. Nevertheless, it was only in March of 1944 that Guderian declared the Panther fully combat capable. He declares it fully Throughout the that winter of 1943-44, the Red Army problems. launched a series of hammer blows against Army Group South, I mean, whereby those, the those German lines were frequently were breached. Fixed. The Panzer it divisions found themselves in the role of fire brigades, down. rushed from one point to another to contest each new Soviet Especially breakthrough. When you're doing this. Extemporized battle groups comprised of elements from different units, with integral all-armed support were often raised to deal with such contingencies. One such was Heavy Panzer Regiment Becker, which had 47 Panthers and 34 Tigers, and was employed as the point of an armoured relief column assembled in early February 1944 to punch a corridor through to 60,000 German troops encircled around Cherkassy. So basically what they're doing with these Panthers is they've got them into huge divisions, 
and uh, these divisions are just driving from left to right all across the front, dealing with any Soviet breakouts. So the Soviets attack and then these Panthers are activated and they, they drive towards that particular battle, which is a good way of doing it. That's that's um, that, that's that's a good way of defending your line. You have um, mobile defenses instead of static defenses, um, and you have like arm, you have um, fire response teams. It's like if you need reinforcements, these guys show up and then help you out. Uh, the, the problem is because the drivetrain is so weak. <laughs> these things are the more these things drive, the more they break down. So they're losing more to breakdowns and having to. Oh crap! I hit the microphone. Sorry. And um, they're losing more to breakdowns and and leaving more Panthers behind because they can't take them with them. Then they're actually losing in battles, and this is just. Oh, Mid March 1944, four Soviet rifle divisions supported by a number of tank units, encircled the German battle group under the command of SS Gruppenführer Herbert Giller in the town of Kovel, a major rail centre for European Russia and of great strategic importance to both sides. A relief force was assembled by the Germans, which included elements from the 4th Panzer Division and was led by a company from the Panther Regiment of the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking under the command of Obersturmführer Nikolusi Lech. The German attack was hampered by the bogged ground like that surrounded the town and which made for excellent defensive cover for the Soviets. It is also an awful tank, but I, I think I've rambled on too much now. The only firm ground available to, <laughs> Try the and stick to just the lay on the upraised <laughs> railway embankment which led so to almost Kovel. an hour in and I'm only 20 no minutes into this hour long document. Nikolusi Lek advanced along the embankment oh with nine Panthers, but then almost immediately lost two to mines. The mines were cleared by following infantry. But it was not until the evening that the Panthers finally broke into the town to strengthen the defenders. It's For his leadership, Panther. Nikolusi Lech was awarded the Knight's Cross. It's got a big radio turn. A number of Panthers had been abandoned along the embankment, victims of mines and Soviet anti-tank fire, including this Befeil's Panther, or Command Panther, identifiable by the second aerial mounted on the rear of the hull. I just After told the them battle, that, thank the Germans used Jesus. captured Soviet prisoners to help recover the knocked out Panthers, most of which were repaired and returned to service. Also recovered were the bodies of the dead crewmen who had been so rapidly interred in the sandy soil between the railway lines alongside their abandoned charges. Yee, grizzly. Covell was finally relieved on April the 5th by a further attack involving Panzer IVs and assault guns from the 3rd Panzer Division, along with other Panthers from Viking. These broke through the strong Soviet defences, covering the northern approach to the town along the Kovel Breslatesk Road. Anti-tank positions were destroyed and overrun, and Soviet tanks, including American Shermans supplied under Lend-Lease, were knocked out on the drive into the town. You get a lot of Lend-Lease um, tanks, mostly Shermans, but um, they had At the a end of lot August of 1944, tanks in Russia. The Soviet summer offensive yeah, had all but Matilda's, destroyed Army Group uh, Center. Valentine's especially. carried the Red Army to the borders of Poland. Uh, they were okay with it was the, here that a propaganda company film team like recorded footage of heavy fighting as the Germans desperately attempted to halt the yeah, Soviet drive westward. As well, but I don't think By this like stage of the war, Waffen SS units were given a particular prominence when filming, and on this occasion the PK team had focused on a localized counterattack by the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. Under the command of Sturmbahn Führer Maedres, elements of the Panther Battalion, supported by Panzer IVs, deployed to attack an advanced Soviet armoured unit of T-3485s and JS-2 tanks the, the that have German occupied advanced units, elements by the 5th filming, and on this uh, occasion the PK team have focused on a localised counterattack by the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. There he is. Okay, so that's, that's like a commander of a, of a Panzer team. Um, what he's doing there is he's pretending to give orders because the, the propaganda team would shoot what was going on and then they would look over the footage and if the lighting was wrong if the pose wasn't heroic enough they would go they would go back and say okay i need you to do the shot again <laughs> and so they'd, they'd, they'd have a german commander strike a more heroic pose and, and pretend to give orders and everything and 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 try and get the lighting right so it was just just perfect for the propaganda reasons Four, that's why deployed to attack an advanced soviet armored happening. unit of t-3485 and js2 tanks that have occupied a number of nearby villages Fire is opened on the Soviet positions by Vespa and Hummel self-propelled guns. The Panthers begin to move towards the target using their speed to move rapidly from one fire position to the next. Grenadiers then follow up in their armoured half-tracks, ready to mop up Soviet infantry in advanced positions. Panthers engage Soviet armour, while the Grenadiers move forward to flush out other Soviet infantry that have gone to ground in the cornfields. <laughs> 
I love the way they're using that MG. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, just lean on me, we'll use that. <laughs> oh, that guy's pelvic bone has been shattered. As the infantry advances through the first burning settlement, SS Gruppenführer Giller, commander of the 4th SS Panzer Corps that carries his name, holds a rapid orders group to determine the next objectives of the unfolding attack. He's in the background attack. a bit obscured because he doesn't look so very well. Reconnaissance detachment of Volkswagen Schwimmwagens at one-ton half track move out to scout ahead of the infantry, who now fan out across the wide and unbroken wheat and maize fields. Half tracks follow up advancing Panthers, who roam across the fields completely devoid of any cover. It is the measure of the secondary role played by air power on the Eastern Front that German armour could still operate in this fashion. Underneath the sky, empty of Soviet aircraft, there's, there's far a high away chance that these tanks aren't actually shooting at anything. Such an operation caught the immediate attention of Allied fighter they're just, bombers. Uh, they're just propaganda shots. Vikings' Hummel detachment has moved up and brings other Soviet positions under fire from their 150 meter guns. Not just a better call, Sal. Panther reference. commanders now scan the next village to determine targets and tactics. Fire is then opened, and shortly thereafter, Viking grenadiers enter the village to find a large number of destroyed and fiercely burning T-3485s and JS-2s. The latter was a heavy... Fuck's sake, right. He said it, didn't he? ...and fiercely burning T-3485s and JS-2s. Yeah, he did. That's a big drink! Heavy Soviet tank! JS-2! If you ever call it a JS-2, I will fucking slap you, silly. It's not a JS-2. It's an IS-2. And a lot of people make this mistake because uh, it's named after Stalin. So, Joseph Stalin, therefore, JS-2. No. You fucking nimnits. It's Joseph in English. In Russian, it starts with an I. Joseph Stalin. Not Joseph. IS-2. Get it fucking right. Twos. The latter was a heavy tank introduced in the spring of 1944. Its 122mm gun was one of the few weapons that could easily penetrate the frontal armour of the Panther. No kidding. But the very high muzzle velocity of the 75mm L71 gun uh, uh, the, 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 still um, The, the 120mm cannon on, on, a, on an IS-2 is actually... It's, a, it's an over-glorified uh, artillery piece. It's not got a great amount of penetration. Uh, capabilities at all that was one of the big problems of the of the is2 um why it wasn't particularly used that well or particularly effectively the panther to affect a first round hit and penetrate the turret armor of the soviet heavy tank but it had meters. very very heavy armor so by As the time was by the clearly, time you were in range, way you could penetrate, range it, it could probably penetrate gun. you that distance, other factors so. such as training the quality of German Besides optics huge, and command like control millimeter artillery just went into play in order to bring like that. about the sort of results you to pound a few heads. Uh, ooh, Even hello. Uh, maybe. Mm, no, that's a T-34. I thought that was a Crusader for a moment. Even though German say, oh, armies yes, no, continued not. to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviet tank arm, they were never enough to dent the immense numbers being turned out of Soviet factories to replace them. That music that's playing in the background, I think that's not allowed to be played on YouTube. Um, <laughs> that might be a bit of a problem later. <laughs> Further to the north, the Third Panzer Army, having been pushed back into Latvia... Might be or might not be. It's usually the just there's more propaganda front, shots. Was engaged in fierce defensive fighting. <laughs> it might fighting. just be Erica. You can't Panther play. battalions sure. fought alongside Tiger. People are very sensitive about this. The footage even gives a glimpse of a couple of surviving Panther Three and Mark Fours. The limited counterattacks being undertaken by these German units, though successful in eliminating local breakthroughs, had no impact on the wider picture. Soviet pressure continued to build, and within a matter of weeks, Third Panzer Army was fighting in East Prussia, with 16th Army holed up in Kurland. Nevertheless, in the tank battles fought by Panther crews, there must have been many occasions when others did what this crew is doing, acknowledging their good fortune and offering up thanks to Krupps for the effectiveness of their armour plate. I'm not going to say anything. On the 6th of June 1944, a long-awaited Allied invasion of Europe took place with virtually unopposed landings on the coast of Normandy. Unopposed landings on the coast of Normandy. I just run you by with what he said there. The Allied invasion of Europe took place with virtually unopposed landings on the coast of Normandy. 
Unopposed landings! Unopposed landings! Oh! First bit of. We're all taking a drink for that now. Fuck the, Jesus. Oh, God. How... Oh. I'm not even touching that with the fucking barge bowl. No, no. You watch any World War II documentary and just look at how unopposed those landings were. Under a massive air umbrella, the Allies managed to land 150,000 men and 500 tanks by day's end. Rommel's insistence that the invasion could only be defeated on the beaches vanished in the absence of a strong panzer force in proximity to the Normandy coast. Okay, here's here's the, here's the other part. I, again, Saint Rommel was like the weirdos, like like fucking Jesus. Um, <laughs> he's really he really be like that. Um, so he says that like well, the, the, the landings need to be. Uh, da, 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 da. We, we, we need to oppose the landings immediately as soon as they happen. We, be, we, we need to fight them on the beaches. And a lot of people came away. Well, well, if only, if if only, if only there there was like if only Rommel had got his way and had 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 put tanks on the beaches and he'd been able to fight them, then then we'd all be speaking German now because D-Day went over. It's like it's bullshit because I'll tell you exactly what happened because of pan because um. A Panzer Division did, in fact, attack the Allied landings. Uh, I believe the Hitler Youth, uh, the 25th uh, SS, the Hitler Youth, uh, with their Stugs, attacked the Allied landings. And what happened was something which would have happened if any Panzer Division had attacked the, the Allied landings, and that is a battleship opened fire on them. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how good your tank is, if a battleship opens fire on you, you're fucked. This in Rommel turn, didn't know what he was talking about half the time. That's why a lot of the suggestions were where ignored. The should be stationed, as well as reflecting the long hell view that the Allied landings would take place in well, the Pacific. Well, great pictures of some unopposed Even landings right June there. Even after June 6th, Allied misinformation would continue to reinforce the German belief that another landing was expected in that region. Even before D-Day, and certainly thereafter, Allied air power was employed to paralyze the movement of German traffic on the ground, with the Luftwaffe long swept from the skies in France. Once ashore, the Allied task was to reinforce the lodgment area, bringing over forces from England as soon as possible, so as to build up Allied strength to combat the inevitable German reinforcement in Normandy. German attacks on the 6th had been cursory. 21st Panzer Division had moved against the British Canadian landing beaches and received Monster. a bloody nose. Yeah. On the following day, Best the 12th SS Panzer Scott Division was in action against the Canadians, effectively blocking the drive to seize Caen, originally targeted for capture on D-Day itself. Stuart Little. Ultimately, the Battle for Khan would become the linchpin for the wider Battle of Normandy. As Allied forces moved inland off the beaches, they rapidly came up against one of the intractables of the campaign and to which little or no thought had been given in the planning stage of the invasion. If the Normandy beaches were chosen for their suitability for mass landings, the countryside inland from the beaches was ideal for defence. The hundreds of small fields, divided by centuries-old, high-banked and almost impenetrable hedges, punctuated by copses and small forests, known to the locals as the Bocage, made forward movement in the face of a spirited enemy extremely difficult. The Allied air campaign to halt the daylight movement of German reinforcements to Normandy, especially by the Panzer Divisions, was no better illustrated than by reference to the travail of the Panzerlehr Panzer Division. As one of the most powerful armoured units in France, it was ordered to make for Caen on the 6th of June and travel in daylight. Due to the constant bombing and strafing from Allied aircraft, the forward units did not arrive until the 8th, and the division was not fully in place until some days later. They actually have King Tigers. It's the first time King Tigers have been seen in, uh, on the Western Front. This experience yeah, was to become a common sure. one, with divisions forced to travel at night and lay up in forests or under the trees in the daytime. The massive use of Allied air power for this purpose led to the extensive destruction of many towns and villages on the approaches to the Normandy battlefield. Yeah, Cam was pretty much just flattened. Along with the Tiger, just, the just Panzer sad, was the most know, powerful but... tank in Normandy, with a total of 484 sent into action in June and July. In theory, the 1st Battalion of every Panzer regiment should have been equipped with Panthers, but this was not the case, with just seven out of the ten Panzer regiments in Normandy 
being so equipped, and with the majority of these belonging to the Waffen SS. The bulk of Panthers and Normans. Yeah. The Waffen SS gets uh, basically they're the, the glory boys. They're hated keys, by the regular German the army Panther because D's. they get all the good equipment and everything. <laughs> the Allies rapidly came to fear the Panther. Although it fired a lighter shell than the 88 mm gun go. of the Tiger, its extremely high muzzle velocity allowed it to take out any Allied tank at long range. There's going to be a lot of drinking and a lot of bullshit. Unfortunately, I've, I've almost drank this entire bottle, which is not a good thing. Um, yeah, there's going to be this because this, this is where the bullshit of this documentary gets even wilder, and that's about the Allied response. The Allies fear the Tiger. Um, potentially, yes, because about when you, know, you, you take into account all the Allied troops on the Western Front, about half of one percent of those would ever see a Tiger. And we're talking like tigers were employed quite viciously and and quite well done. You know they they weren't they weren't fucking around with using you know them using tigers. Excuse me. Uh, so they typically they'd be deployed from ambush positions, and what would happen is the myths and legends of the tiger kind of overtook the actual functionality of the tiger. So every time, every time. Um, a, a tank was getting hit by an 88 millimeter. It was like, oh, it's a tiger. Uh, every time they'd see um, a German tank, oh, it's a tiger. Um, so the Americans at this point have, by the time the Normandy campaign ends, the Americans have claimed to have destroyed more tiger tanks than were ever actually built. Uh, so I give you some perspective on the kind of what what's going on and the, the typical mind of an Allied soldier at this point. Shermans, Cromwells, and Churchills were all easy targets at a thousand yards. You, you notice he's, he's now switched from meters to yards. You know, when he's talking about fighting the Russians, it's all in meters. <laughs> and then he has to, and then when he's talking about the elephants, he has to switch to yards. So so it's it's still a thousand. It's a big, impressive number. You know, it's, it's, ah, this fucking documentary. The vulnerability of allied tanks to the Panther and Tiger nearly became a political scandal in the United Kingdom. Nearly. Nearly became a political scandal. This this line gets repeated quite a lot in almost every single documentary you see. Um, they talk about it nearly becoming a scandal. Um, what that basically means is it did not become a scandal. <laughs> uh, because Allied tanks... I was talking earlier about hard factors and soft factors, Allied tanks, especially um, the Sherman and the Cromwell, uh, the cruiser tanks, um, pathetically laughable in the hard factors compared to the Tiger or the Panther, very good in the soft factors. Very, very good in the soft factors. Um, vastly superior in the soft factors. You could reload those guns faster, you can repair them faster, um, you can camouflage them a hell of a lot easier, they, they even run on less fuel. And the thing about a panther is if you take out just one of those wheels, I mean, there's a picture of a Churchill on the screen, so I'll take that as an example. The panther has these interlaced wheels, and if you take out one of them, uh, you've basically disabled the panther, because the panther needs a full set of wheels to run it. it maybe get by on one damaged wheel, but if it wants to replace that damaged wheel, it has to take off one wheel, and then another wheel, and then another wheel, and another wheel to get to that wheel that's right at the back. Uh, the, the Churchill pictured here could lose about half of those wheels and still run fine. And you just, you just, it's one bolt and it comes off. So you can replace, you can repair that easily and the, the tank keeps going. And that's more important on a battlefield than um, thicker armor. Tank armor is overrated. Uh, I'll do a video and rant about that on a later date. Uh, we've got 20 minutes to go. Hold on there! Intervene to insist. We've got 20 minutes to go. We can do this! Was overblown. And that allied tanks were well up to the task expected of them. And he was right, they were. While the such a view may have been acceptable for official consumption, allied tank crews remained extremely skeptical. These are rare crop. Many allied tanks now began to carry extra armor in the form of welded on track shoes. It was, however, discovered that a panther could be killed by getting close enough to get in a shot this on the here. lower part of the gun mantlet. The tank shell would then ricochet downward to break through the thinner hull top armor above the driver and machine gun operator. American tank was also discovered that a shell ricocheting off the ground in front of the Panther might penetrate the lower hull armor. With both these men- Okay. So was any of that actually fucking true? 
Uh, here's the thing. Uh, yes and no. So that shell ricochet tactic uh, was discovered with the Tiger. And it was found to be a very effective way of taking one out. If you could aim, unless you're on soft ground, you could just aim a shot just in front of the Tiger to hit the ground just in front of it, and the shell would bounce up and hit the rear and hit the, the lower armor and throw through the bottom. Uh, you could also hit the turret mantlet and the shell could potentially ricochet downwards into the tank itself. These were viable tactics, but these were not the main ways that American tankers especially would be taking Panthers out. What they would do is um, there's, this whole, there's this whole myth surrounding Tigers, and that is it took five Shermans to take out a single Tiger. And that is because uh, when I was, I was talking earlier about um, fire response groups, uh, so you'd have a breakout, and then your, your fire team would arrive to reinforce you. A fire team in the American lines, and often the British lines as well, was a squad of Sherman tanks, of which there was five. <laughs> so if a tiger appeared on your front line to start attacking you, and you, requ and you requested support from the fire team, five Shermans would show up. So that's where the whole myth comes from. And if they realized what they were fighting, it's like, oh, it's a heavy German tank. Right, okay. What they would do is they would position one or two Shermans really far away, just firing pop shots, trying to trying to distract this thing, trying to distract the tiger, and then the other Shermans would just would just slip in around the side and hit it in the side armor, and that was the tactic that they used. Um, the the tactics for deflecting shells either through the bottom or through the turret mantlet. Those were kind of like emergency tactics. Like if you find yourself going mano a mano with a panther or a tiger, this is what you do. Um, but by this point, Shermans also have um, they have an emergency round on board, so they have um, they have an APTBD core tank uh, round. I don't know what it's called, but it's it's basically it's a, it's a tungsten core tank. It's the thing that opens up, and there's like a, a tungsten dart inside. Um, each Sherman would have typically about one of those. Some would have two. And that was like an emergency. Like, okay, okay, I've turned the corner. There's a tiger in front of me. Load that shell. And that'll just, that'll go straight through a tiger. At, at almost any range. But the, the invincibility of the tiger is kind of, and the panther kind of somewhat overblown. Uh, so panther had a bit slightly better frontal armor and there was a because of the slope it had a greater penetration um a greater bounce um thingy with jiggy god god i should stop drinking i'm slurring my words again this is why i don't live stream that often <laughs> yeah so the because it was sloped the, the the shell would 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 bounce off um but not so much on the tiger because the tiger was less it was kind of sloped but it was less sloped uh, but a sherman Within like a couple of hundred meters range, its regular um, armor piercing round would go straight through that tiger. Uh, again, tank armor is not as good as you think it is. It's <laughs> but I think methods it's, required it's, it's the Allied tank to get well within the Panther's gun range. It took a brave crew to attempt such a tactic. We didn't emergency tactics. I told you these were emergency tactics. Were not Only the Sherman tactics. Firefly. A conversion undertaken by the British, whereby the they replaced now. the low velocity, short-barreled 75mm gun of the Sherman with a modified version of their own 17-pounder uh, anti-tank gun. Big, put the big gun the in it! It doesn't fit! Tilt it sideways! We can't get the radio and put a box in the back and put it in there! Ranges. Fireflies were issued on the basis of one per troop of four Shermans. Naturally, Panther commanders attempted to target the Fireflies first in any British tank. Interesting story about the Firefly. The long 17-pound um, barrel never operated being a Firefly. unique recognition feature. But did buy some. Tank crews often tried to so, disguise this so as to render the tank less obvious. So, um, I, I forget. I forget. Fireflies were big, big, big American Panthers, commander. As is seen in the still of the knocked out Model A in the Odon Valley. Eisner. Until the arrival of the American M26, he wants a 90 millimeter gun just before the end of the war. They wouldn't let him have the, the Firefly remained unique in its ability to take on and, and he said, no, we need Persians. Uh, we need a heavy tank. 
And he went, no, 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 you can't have them. And so what he did was he ordered, he very, very publicly Even Panthers could not ordered a hundred Sherman fireflies from the British. The heavy and the Americans were like, what? What? Americans using, Americans the using British tech? We can't do this now. Um, lying off the Normandy and so coast, then he got the, he got the Pershings. With calibers ranging up to 16 there's, there's inches. Tank that's been the effect of one of these shells falling along the side of the Panther was enough to flip the 45 ton Panther onto its back. <laughs> Movement of German armour was very often targeted by such means with similar results. Yeah, don't don't be doing that. that that's why you don't attack the Normandy beaches in your Panther. Fighting among the hedgerows was very much the opposite of the conditions for which the Panther was designed. The difficulty in moving in daylight meant that tanks in effect functioned as mobile pillboxes. In such circumstances, the smokeless powder and very low muzzle flash of the Panther made it difficult to spot to oncoming Allied armour. He says that, if that the is as if Normandy, that's unique to the Panther. Most footage shows tanks Panthers very heavily camouflaged. You see these little masses of foliage covering the machine. On the front of tanks, like little box Indeed. things, got holes. The skillful in provision that is, of such that became quite literally a matter of life and death for all Panthers and the old in Normandy. Had right. Yeah, see that thing? That's a, that's a flash suppressor. Every, pretty much every tank has one of those, especially in the Second World War. Even as the Allies were grinding is. down the German forces in Normandy, the propaganda ministry saw fit to show Remember what I said about an hour ago? They had taken a bunch of um, <laughs> they had taken a bunch of no tank noises and put it over the footage, and I was like saying, "Oh, it comes from a propaganda film." This is it. This is the propaganda film. A Panther against an Allied tank, even though that chosen was an M3 Lee, which was no longer serving in armored divisions in Europe. Naturally enough, the footage clearly revealed the superiority of the Panther. One can only assume that the Ministry had determined that having seen this film, German civilians would go home to their beds confident that the fate of the Reich must be assured the army possessed such superior weapons. But now just, just on this that point here, this film, um, so what's happening here is we've got a, a claim test between a Panther and an M3 Lee, which is an old Allied tank, no longer in service. Um, just, they refused to use a Sherman because the Sherman actually outperformed the Panther during the first test, so that footage was, was deleted immediately. Um, what You can't see the slope at the bottom here because what's happening here is there's the Panther has actually got a... You'll see that this, this, the slope appears to be a bit higher than the one the M3 Lee is on. That is because there is a step here. The, the Panther is coming up a step. There is not a step in front of the Lee. In fact, there's actually a spike so as it rises up, it hits the spike and gets confident. stuck. But the fate of the Reich must be assured the army possessed that hill superior weapons. Perfectly fine. Propaganda! No, oh, look at the little command car. German veterans of the Normandy campaign always recall to their horror <laughs> The overwhelming so impact on ground operations got, like, of over. Allied fighter bombers. Then they were actually scared of planes. Yeah, the In Allies had air superiority. The RAF Typhoon, which carried eight sixty-pound rockets, had an explosive power that could defeat even a Panther. And then that's all you Although get. only a single battalion of the Jag Panther served in Normandy, it made a very singular impression. Now, Designed a as a heavy tank destroyer. Tank. Employing the Panther God, chassis, the Yak tank, the Yak uh, Panther Yak mounted Panther a version right. of the 88mm Pac-43 heavy anti-tank gun that also equipped the Tiger II heavy panzer, which saw service in Normandy. Was that the any 88mm good? Pac-43 no. had been employed by the Army as an anti-tank weapon since 1943. Had problems in the sights, large, like heavy big and cumbersome, problems in the sights. Very Couldn't high muzzle velocity was able to defeat any known Soviet and Allied tank at ranges of up to 3,000 meters. The fighting compartment of the Jag Panther had been designed by extending up with the side plates and upper hull. We'll talk about a, a, a fight Panther they tank. have with uh, Churchill's at some point. Uh, the 392 there. were produced in total, supply never being able to meet demand. Footage of these vehicles is very scarce. This Jag Panther being filmed on the Oda in 1945. Yeah, they were rare as crochets, those things. This Jag Panther, found abandoned, minus its tracks, along with two others, had ambushed a squadron of Churchill tanks belonging to the 6th Guards Tank Brigade on the 30th of July in Normandy. Within the space of a few minutes, ten Churchills had been knocked out. 
In the melee, British tanks knocked out two of the German tank destroyers. I need you to understand that very quickly. Okay, so you have a squad of, so it's maybe about five or six of these uh, Jag Panthers. Ambush, um, from an ambush position, take out ten Churchills. These are heavy British tanks. Now that that's, people are like, oh my god, they, they take out the Churchill, the Churchill, that's huge bits of armor. That, that's, that's expected. Because again, armor's not as good as you can think it is! Um... But yeah, so they ambush, they ambush the Churchills, but the thing about the thing that's more interesting is when the Churchills return fire, they destroy two Yak Panthers. And these things have apparently got like super duper armor. These things. <laughs> People go on about their armor being like almost invincible. I'm like, no, no, uh, British or Allied tank could take these things out. It was impossible. And there it is. It's been taken out by a Churchill, which had the same gun, uh, slightly better, slightly better version of the uh, Sherman gun. Although German opposition remained fierce right through July and into August, the breakout of the American forces from the Cotentin Peninsula and the drive by Patton's Third Army across the rear of the German position in Normandy opened up the prospect of the Allies effecting an encirclement of the Army of the West. As the British battled south towards Falaise in the face of desperate German resistance, the Americans took Argenton. The Allied pincers did not close around Falaise until the 18th of August, and in that time, substantial German forces had slipped away. But most of the heavy equipment had been abandoned. Those German forces trapped in the pocket oh, no. were subjected to heavy artillery and tank fire from British, that, Canadian that, and Polish forces. Um, that's a particular footage from um, a panther fighting uh, a perishing tank. Um, they, they got out. The crew gets out. Okay, just just they don't burn and fire. The, the, the tank doesn't just catch fire immediately and they all die. They get out. It's on the northern edge. The they survived the war. They were taken prisoner. To the south, American forces delivered their own heavy bombardment. The Germans, however, continued to offer heavy resistance. Destruction within the pocket was mounting as British and American fighter bombers also rocketed and strafed the panzers, lorries and horse-drawn wagons parked end-to-end -end on the roads leading into Falaise. Falaise pocket, as um, th that battle could just be summed up. And then Poland arrived! <laughs> Very few of the panzers survived and this the destruction. Happened. And their <laughs> fate, as abandoned, smouldering and blackened hulks, was recorded by Allied cameramen after the surrender of the German forces in the pocket. Those forces that did escape from Falaise now set off at speed to reach the Seine bridges. Surviving heavy equipment was nursed through the narrow roads whilst under constant attack from Allied fighter bombers. A few Panthers and these Jag Panthers of Battalion 654 escaped the pocket, but having reached the river, discovered that Allied aircraft had already destroyed the bridges, able to carry the weight of their heavy armoured vehicles. They were thus unable to cross. And there's another reason that you don't always have heavy tanks. Only light vehicles could be taken across on the rafts or use the hastily constructed pontoon bridges. In such circumstances, the tank crews had little choice but to blow up their machines. It is only towards the end of the war that footage of the Panther in action becomes more common on newsreels. This is both a reflection of the greater number of these Panthers in service by this time and a marked decline in the numbers of Tiger Ones and the very small number of King Tigers serving in the heavy tank battalions. Yeah, it's because These they were all destroyed by this point. These units particular interest to the propaganda department, as there had been a deliberate policy of depicting them to the German public as elite units. These Panther A's are some of the 60 on strength, with the Hermann Goring Panzer Corps when filmed in combat sometime between the 15th of October and the 4th of November 1944, when the Red Army launched its invasion of East Prussia by a thrust between the towns of Gumbinen and Goldap. The German response was to launch a limited concentric counterattack to seal off the Soviet drive into the East Prussian hinterland, with the Hermann Goring Corps and the 39th Panzer Corps thrusting into the flanks of the 11th Guards Army. In conditions of local air superiority, Luftwaffe Stukas proceeded to bomb the advancing Soviet armor, with the Panthers following with their own attack. 
While it is clear the Panzers inflicted heavy losses on the Russians, it must always be borne in mind that it was a feature of the propaganda function of newsreels that the PK camera teams never showed any destroyed German armour or dead German soldiers. And there it is. The guy Following finally the admits invasion of Romania, the one source he's been using this entire time is biased. The limited armoured forces available to the Germans yeah. fought desperately. A lot of people take German of the um, propaganda the reels as like on the face value, the like they show what they show, but you, the you need to understand Romania like they're the showing a very obscure version of what's actually going on. The, Russians. the blunting of localised Soviet thrusts by Panther units could not in the end have any major impact on the wider picture. Whatever the particular technical skills displayed by the I mean, the I will admit this, this entire document is not actually but It's one of the better ones. There's just a lot of like little Throughout little technical details that they get wrong Panther and just little um, the fourth Panzer army in little Poland myths that they just bleed into. You know, it's, it's, but that's you get forces. that you get these in almost all footage from this period the reflects the continual It's just on their legs that you have to fight against when you're a limited like, counterattack to see a story of these kind of things. Just like all the myths if the had a swan song and legends that people believe, and it's like, oh, that's not what happened in the series of aborted German attacks around Lake Palaton in Hungary between February and March of 1945. On the 18th and 19th of September 1944, units of the 5th Panzer Army, which was but a pale shadow of the strength implied by its designation, was directed to attack and seize the town of Luneville on the Moselle River in eastern France, in order to stop the advance of Patton's 3rd US Army towards the German border. The few Panthers available for the attack... Oh god, I knew I should have... I, you know what I should have done? I should have, I should have just played... I, I, should have, I should have just played a game. I didn't want to because I wanted to like not go from because I I did gaming before it just tragically failed. Uh, let's 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 actually just look at how tragic it went for me, shall we? Um, here's here's my dumbass fucking channel. Yeah, um, yeah, it it, it 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 goes well. Like I I start my my first videos like oh like thirty views twenty nine twelve. I, I, I come back with the opens a toilet 62, 110 for war game, and then 64, back to 95, 65 again, 44, 33, 24, 32, 17, 14. <laughs> you, you can tell I'm doing something wrong there. So fuck, fuck gaming, and uh, let's concentrate on 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 history shit. I don't. So I don't want to. I didn't want to go from history shit. Gaming to history shit, then back to gaming games. I don't want to play a game, but I probably should have done that in, in context. Oh, God. Ugh. Why do I drink with these things? It's a bad idea. Why do I... Don't drink. Don't drink, boys and girls. I had one who's actually watching and got this far. Well done, by the way. Congratulations. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna... <laughs> uh, the next 10 minutes is basically just them kind of wrapping up. Um, what happened to Germany? I'll spoil it for you. They lost. Um, but I'm gonna wrap it up here because I I'm I want to go enjoy my birthday and I'm very I'm, I'm I need to sober up. I need a cup of coffee. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to just pause the stream and go fuck off for for 20 minutes while I, I I'd scream and put my head into a bucket of cold water. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm gonna say a few things. Um, basically. A lot of people, stupid people, seem to believe that, for some reason, America wins the war and then takes home all these amazing secret war-winning technology developed by the Nazis and go, Oh, wow! UFOs, nuclear bombs, uh, flying bees that at at attack you with swastika jelly. I don't know. Um... And, and then they think, what should we do with all this war-winning equipment, this, this revolutionary technology that, 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 that would have changed the world if, if the Nazis had won? Should we use it in our war against the Russians? No, let's bury it in a desert somewhere. <laughs> People genuinely believe that that's what America did. Here's the thing about America, is the American military had an opportunity and use that opportunity to test everything the Germans built. And they tested it for years, and they had billions of dollars behind it, which is all things you and I don't have. So we're gonna have to take the tests that they did, literally, and the results of those tests were that 
nothing worked. The Germans did not really build much revolutionary technology that the uh, Allies didn't already have or were not already aware of. Um, in regards to the Panther, the French take, um, after the Second World War, the French capture shitloads of Panthers, uh, repair them all, build spare parts, put them into service, as they've got two divisions of uh, Panther tanks up until about 1956, where they replace them all because they were fucking terrible. <laughs> they hated them with a passion. The crews hated, absolutely hated the Panther tanks. They broke down continuously. The sights were terrible. The armor was paper thin. And they couldn't get them to work. And then when they, when they put them through testing, realized that they would have to take extensive modernization in order to get back up and running when it was just easier for them to build their own vastly superior, much better tank, which is what they did. And that is the story of the first Thanksgiving. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm going to go pee. Bye-bye.